and it was Rene Ricard. And he was coming over to interview him for Art Forum. My first Art Forum cover story was about Julian Schnabel. And I knew that the next person I wrote about had to be totally unknown, had to be terribly young, very ambitious. I wanted to latch on to a career that I could watch and write about for a long time, like I had with Julian Schnabel. That piece, The Radiant Child, was very involved in helping Jean-Michel in his early career. It was an article in Art Forum. Rene Ricard. Rene Ricard. So the second I saw his work, I got yes. very excited. He actually came up to talk about the painting that we had purchased. He drew our attention to the snake in the corner, which was very well done. And he was very, very proud of it. Do you ever comply with the request to describe your work? I never know how to really describe it, except maybe, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to describe my work. Do you feel that that's important to you, though, not to be able to describe it? It's like asking somebody, you know, how does your horn, asking Miles, you know, how does your horn sound, you know, I mean, you can really, I don't think he can really tell you, you know, mm -hmm. why, why he played, you know, why he plays this at this point in, in the music, or, you know, just, it's, it's sort of on automatic, you know, most, most of the time. Has anybody ever written anything about your work that you think is on the ball? Probably um, Robert Ferris Thompson, I thought, wrote the best thing, the, the guy that wrote Flesh and the Spirit which is probably the best book I ever read on African art. It's probably the best. But he had a special talent to take the, all the street energies and translate them into high art. He had this unique ability to access almost everything that was in his mind and memory bank, channel it through his body, and put it right there on that rectangle of canvas or paper. Jean, I don't know how he got his knowledge, but he knew so much. His family background was superior to the average uh, child. He was, at a minimum, trilingual. The mother's language was Spanish. His father's language was French and Creole, and he spoke extreme. People just take it for granted, but the highest artists are almost always plurilingual. Uh, Picasso spoke Catalan, Spanish, French, so what's the first artist work that you remember seeing that left a really strong impression on you? Probably seeing the Guernica was probably my favorite thing when I was a kid. I remember my mother drawing stuff out of the Bible, like Samson breaking the temple down, stuff like this. Was she a good artist? Pretty good. His mom was more close to the earth. But I never knew her. His father was fairly affluent, middle class. Uh, he was an accountant. He dressed in like blue blazers with brass buttons. <laughs> oh, his father was a smashing tennis playing kind of guy. His father was, you know, in straight Greenwich. They lived on Pacific Street. They owned the whole building. So then you started doing your own little drawings? I thought I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was younger, and then I changed to painting when I was about, you know, I don't know, 15 or so. So you like the black sheep of the family? Well, I was until I started doing well. One of the interesting things about his work is the way it shoots references to other artists he admired. The work is full of references to Leonardo da Vinci. He wasn't unambitious. Nobody could accuse Basquiat of that. I remember he had uh, the Venus to Milo in the middle of one of his paintings. And I said, what's she all about? I said, that's to, so you know that we're entering art history. talking to the great history of painting that came before him, and he's very much aware of it, and that's the context of his work. He's talking to Twombly, he's talking to de Kooning, he's talking to Pollock. I always think of him as a great artist of all time, 
I put him in the highest place like Van Gogh, like Picasso. There's also the important fact that he's not limiting himself to visual artists as mentors. That's another thing that marked his genius. He never copied, he always improvised a total revision. Jean-Michel was demanding that if you're gonna talk about influence man, then you gotta realize that influence is not influence, it's simply someone's idea going through my new mind. What books do you like? You know, either ones that you know or, or have facts in them, or, or like, I guess Mark Twain. Or, I like Mark Twain books a lot. You were reading William Burroughs when you were out here the last time. I was going to say Burroughs, but I thought I'd, be, I'd sound too young if I, because everybody reads Burroughs all the time. But he, he's my favorite living author, definitely. The work owes a lot to the influence of William Burroughs and John Giorno that school of poetry. Jean-Michel adored William. I mean, he was a great fan. The Burroughs cut-up technique of slicing up, of collaging things, this is a very important part of the structure of Jean-Michel's work. William Burroughs, he got from the Surrealists this idea of cutting up like a page of your own text written on a typewriter paper. You'd cut it in four or five places and then rearrange them. And when you read across, you read those amazing images arise. And so this is another concept of how you could perceive it, of wisdom arising. Because a lot of it is gibberish, you know, when you're reading it. But then all of a sudden, a clear line grows across, and that's profoundly profound. So that's the, the essence of the, the cut-up. And then the influence of John Cage, Vanguard Jazz, Miles Davis, Coltrane, that all of these sounds are interesting. He's putting in Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and the whole roster of jazz heroes who he can assimilate into his pantheon. What music do you like? Bebop's my, guess my favorite music. But I don't listen to it all the time. I listen, I listen to everything. But I have to see Bebop as my favorite music. The Bebop aesthetic in terms of the way you put visually on the page. Bebop broke down melody and it broke down harmonies in ways that hadn't been done before. That's creating another vocabulary for how to play jazz. His collage technique was to take things and blow them up. He had the expression, boom for real. An explosion, and then you end up with fragments, rather than the cubist or post-cubist way of building sections, patching things together, or quilt work. Jean-Michel's work was not about a quilt. It was about a kind of galaxy of reality that's been, again, exploded. So everything is equal. a big loft and it was pretty fancy. I was going over there and three four nights a week and there was a lot of other people that were always coming over. It was really an incredible scene. People who knew Jean-Michel saw him hanging out socially active late into the night. So the question is, when did he do the work? There is an astonishing amount of work. He had an incredible work ethic, incredible focus. If people were over, he didn't just sit and visit. He was constantly painting, constantly getting inspiration from something someone had just said or something that was on the television. I don't know, I came the first day and I basically never left for months. And I would go home and he would call up and ask me to come back because he wanted to get to work again. So basically, it was 24 hours. His paintings that he came up with with his assistant, Steve Torton, where the, the corners were sticks sticking out like some person wrapped these things up and just make it quickly into a, a framed canvas. Or Basically, he showed me a pile of wood, molding wood, like, you know, the little curly moldings, very flimsy wood, a window chain, carpet tacks, canvas, and he asked me if I could make a stretcher out of it. So that is basically what gave birth to those stretchers. Terrific set of paintings. I mean, we bought a couple, but we should have bought every single one. When I 
I moved into the Crosby Street loft, for a while collectors would come over to look at the work, and if he didn't like them, you know, if somebody said, I want a painting with shades of red in it to match my couch, he would become absolutely furious. He would throw them out, he would often pour food on their heads from outside the window, like cereal or water or milk, out the window as they were leaving. Jean-Michel was famously independent of mind. No one ever told Jean-Michel Basquiat what to do and what not to do. He did whatever he wanted to do. He turned the art world into a sports, like a tennis thing, where you had your ranking, you know, boxing. All his metaphors were sports. But he had no qualms about being ambitious. He was very anxious to be number one, and he was very concerned that when he wasn't number one, he was on his way up the ladder. There was a young guy who was painting, and I should see him, and he knew, you know, different people that I knew. So I went down, and, and I liked him. And at the same time, he was very competitive. One day, uh, Mr. Chow, he said something to me, because he always talked about us having a boxing match. I said, you know, you're going to get the boxing match that you've been asking for if you don't cool it. Fabulous, uh, you know, way to start a, a you know, a friendship and a, and a business relationship, and and it was one of the, you know, as an art dealer, I got to say, it was one of the most exciting things that have happened in my business career. I was in the waiting area at Spago's on Sunset, waiting to, to get in at like 10 o'clock at night, and Jean Michel walked in with Rommel Z and Fab Five Freddy all behind Larry Gagosian, and the restaurant came to a complete silence. I mean, these three young black men, all more handsome than the next, and just, you know, who, I, I don't know if people thought that they were in front of the newest Hollywood stars or were about to get robbed, <laughs> but the restaurant just came to a dead silence. It was fantastic. First time I met Jean-Michel Basquiat, is I was working in an art gallery while I was going to film school. And he came in while we were having an opening and he had um, a cassette with him. And he asked me if I had any way to play it. I took him to the back room and I had a boom box back there. And in like five minutes, he turned the back office into like VIP dance area. <laughs> it was a blast and we had just like a crazy opening. Everybody came. Like by that time, the word had kind of spread. This guy he was making, you know, incredibly exciting, powerful work. Twenty years old or whatever. I went to the show at Gagosian Gallery, and it was huge. I mean, we were totally caught off guard by the energy and the content of the work. He was a phenomenon. Extremely well received by the players in LA, the Hollywood crew. My recollection was they were all basically sold by the time of the opening. He left to Nina Nosei after just a year. He called me up and I said, I'll introduce you to Bruno Bischofberger, who had shown an interest to me before. So I called him from Switzerland and I said, could I become your art dealer and represent you? He said, absolutely. I was hoping you would ask me. He sometimes asked me, Bruno, how do you like this? And I said, that was fantastic. And he said, ah, you like just any old chick, anyhow, he would say. <laughs> but when you dared to put the smallest criticism, he would very get furious. And I said, these look very sloppy, these paintings, but every line and everything I do, I know exactly what I do. And it has to be like that. And don't you think this is not, this is done by chance or so, these things. to Europe to see me at least twice a year, mostly three or four times a year. He loved to go with us to museums and see any kind of art, from archaeology to, to folk art, to expressions, the great taste and the great eye of, of quality uh, in all different fields.
things started to change very quickly thereafter. He was rapidly becoming a millionaire. With a guest at the time, we would go out to dinner, we go back to the studio, and he's in this expensive Armani suit. He sees some painting, and he feels compelled to change it, and he's painting there in his Armani suit. He was in the loft on Crosby Street. There would be like piles of money all over the place. He was very young, and he had never had this much money, and I, I think it was very awkward for him. Do you spend it? Do you save it? He had bought two new colored televisions and a TIAC recording machine, and he didn't have a bank account. He would often hide the money around the house, so when I would be cleaning up, I would find thousands of dollars under the cushions of the couch or in the pages of a book. That's the way he was living, and he was living high. And whenever I would go over to visit, there was always 20 people. <laughs> So what was your first reaction when you started selling work and making a little money? I don't know, overconfidence with myself, not you know, super confidence. I was just happy that I was able to stick it out and then, you know, and then get things I wanted, you know, mm -hmm. after. I felt like I, like I was right, you know what I mean? The first really major press about Jean Michel is a story in the New York Times Magazine. For a young African-American fine artist, it was incredible. It was literally rock star status. There's this incredible photograph of him on the cover. You know, that's really about Jean Michel as a person, as a phenomenon. And so he's propelled into the bigger world of culture. Jean Michel become gigantic celebrity, famous, wealthy, hanging out with celebrities being praised, lavish, gifts and money. Everybody wanted a piece of him. It seems to me of all the painters who've risen, you're the one who gets singled out as this kind of personality. But at the same time, I sort of enjoy, I enjoy, the, I enjoy that they think I'm a bad boy. Like yeah. Great. The whole bevy of beautiful came into the picture. And I remember saying to him, I want you to understand what it feels like to be famous, so go and do what you have to do. <laughs> so it was very hard for me, very hard. He used to often call me Venus in the paintings, and when he was having an affair with Madonna, he painted a painting of me beating up Madonna. We did get in a fight at the Roxy. I'm embarrassed of that. He was an intense center of a cult. He was a cult figure of huge proportions. Nobody knows what it's like if you're two painters in that situation. Nobody else was in that situation with him. They had a different kind of, re, you know, whether it was Fab Five Freddy or all different, they had a different kind of, you know, I wasn't his peer in that sense. I was an older guy to him. And he always wanted to know what I thought. So the reason why I made the movie, I wanted to tell him what I thought. I thought I owed it to him. Ten bucks piece. Ten bucks. Oh, gee, it didn't work very much on these. I can give you like five. Bruno, can I borrow some money? He met Andy through me when I took him to a lunch to be photographed for a portrait. Jean Michel did not want to stay for lunch. He said, No, I have to go. I, I can't stay. About an hour and something later, he arrived with this huge painting. He just went home, and after this little Polaroid of Andy and him, he painted this painting very fast, a really great masterpiece. We all gathered around, and Andy said to me, he said, oh, I'm so jealous. I said, why? He said, oh, he's fatter than me. <laughs> Andy Warhol, like most people, was very seduced and enamored by Jean Michel, and I think probably had a crush on him. It was such a big thing for Jean to become that close with Andy, but he was yeah. the master of the game. It was great to be that tight with somebody that we all looked up to in that way. Okay, are we rolling? Mm -hmm. We're rolling? <laughs> oh, and this is my best, I mean, no, not the richest artist in the world, uh, Jean-Michel. Jean-Michel, what's your last name? What's your last name, sweetheart? Basquiat. 
Jean-Michel wanted to be an artist in the great galleries, Mary Boone, Leo Castelli. But he was not an artist that was embraced by art world conoscenti. You know, he was considered kind of an artist that could be on the cover of the New York Times magazine section because there was a lot of underground feel to the work. But I think there were still a lot of people in the art world who didn't put him on the same level as Schnabel and Sally and Baselitz and people like that. I guess he saw Julie and Schnabel and David Sally. I think they all had big shows at the Whitney. But he didn't have, have that kind of recognition. I asked him first which gallery he would like to be in, and he of course chose Leo Castelli. And Leo, in the meantime, has known a little bit about him and so, and that he wasn't a very easy person. And he told me, Bruno, I think I'm too old to deal with such a difficult artist. And uh, I was a little bit disappointed, especially for Jean-Michel. The kind of art that was esteemed in the mid-1970s, minimalism, conceptualism, didn't really allow for much innovation. If you just kept pushing minimal painting and sculpture, you ended up with something academic. The art was mostly minimal when I came up, and it, I, it sort of confused me a little bit. I thought it divided people a little bit. I thought it alienated most, most people from art, you know? Mm -hmm. He was really a pioneer in neo-expressionism, and so he was breaking boundaries just by the nature of the work. I think people really misunderstood. At one point, he did a drawing as big as this painting here, and he wanted it to go to a New York museum. I said, OK, I'll donate it. We offered it to MoMA, and the Museum of Modern Art came back and said, well, he isn't worth the space. And then we tried the Whitney, and they rejected it also. When you first see brand new work, chances are, if it's really significant, it will be uncomfortable to somebody like myself because I am so immersed in what painting up until now looked like. And with Basquiat, many art professionals had skepticism about what he was doing because the paintings didn't necessarily fit their idea of a museum painting. And yet, of course, that's exactly what's necessary in order to create the art of the future. How do, you, how do you work? Do you just uh, start with a blank canvas and just start painting? I usually put a lot down in it, and then I, then, then I take a lot away. Then I put some more down, and then I take some more away. You know, so it's like a constant editing process, usually. What, what do people like in your work that you, or that, that got you me. Said, got, <laughs> There's something very direct about Jean-Michel's work that appeals to everyone. It doesn't just appeal to the intellectual, but it does appeal to the intellectual. He appealed to a lot of people who didn't have a great knowledge of art history, but just looked at the work and liked it. It wasn't school. It was never something calculated. That's not to say that he didn't look very closely at what he was doing, but I mean, it wasn't something that he was following some pattern. It was an instinct. He had an incredible instinct, you know, writing the word tar five times, crossing it out four times. He was really a once-in-a-generation talent. making words pictorial, making them part of a picture. Anybody who has eyes, they can see that he's channeling his inner child. What's your, what's your earliest, most vivid childhood memory? Probably getting hit by a car, I guess. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? I was playing in the street. How old were you? I was seven, seven or eight years old. And were you, what were you thinking when it happened? Did you think this is it? It seemed very dreamlike seeing the, the car. I mean, it was just like in the movies when they, when they, when they slow it down. Uh -huh. you know, when, when a car's coming at you, it was, it was just like that. And did they like take you to the hospital and the whole thing? 
Yeah, yeah, I had an operation in my stomach for business. Like certain things that happen to you in psychology, you're arrested in time. And he consciously and intentionally took that idea as a painter and ran with it. I'm going to return to that time. I'm going to hold my instrument in a way that a child would. I'm going to draw the way a child does. He was also the most advanced contemporary mind. He was both creatures. So uh, I understand uh, that you uh, hobnob with the hobnobs. <laughs> <laughs> and you go to this club called Area. Is that true? Yeah, when you get to Area, there's a lot of people outside. 